Hi, this is the second part of the AFNI hands-on for learning how to use the AFNI GUI and continues directly after the first part ended. I'm back continuing to explain the AFNI graphical user interface. The, here is the listing again of the AFNI Data6 AFNI directory with AFNI files and so and other files. When AFNI starts, it reads in all the files it knows how to read, and the files in the directory it doesn't know how to read, it just silently ignores. So I'm starting AFNI again, and then they move the, get rid of the terminal window for the moment because we don't need it. And here's the presentation presentation we're back at so there's more pop-up menus along the bottom and I want to show you uh, uh, at least one more important interface element in the interface for the image viewer and that's the saving image button so let me bring up let me close this let me close this let me bring this image up here and we come to the bottom row, we did MUNT already. Next to MUNT is a button that says save1.jpg. If I click on that, it says image saver1. It will let me save the current image, which can be, I uh, type in a prefix for this, so let's call it uh, Fred, because I like the name Fred. Fred, it will be named Fred.jpg. If I Type .jpg, it won't make it fred.jpg.jpg. It will actually say, oh, well, you, I don't need to put the jpg there. Blow up, that's just a scaling factor. So if I wanted to scale it up by a factor of two or three or something, I could do that. But uh, you can also, of course, do that in external software. Open in GIMP. If the, if the GNU image manipulation program is stored on your computer and available, then it actually leaves a button here so you can open it directly into GIMP for further editing, but I'm not going to do that now. I just click set and it saves the image. How do you know it saves the image? You can see that back in the terminal window. It said writing one image to file fred.jpg. AFNI puts itself in the background so I can still can type commands into that. I'm going to open fred.jpg. Let's see what it looks like. Well, that's in IMAX, so that opens it up in the preview program. It looks like what it did on the screen with the crosshairs. It saves the image as it is, which includes the crosshairs. So we can get rid of the crosshairs, yes. It might be worth noting that uh, people who use Linux like myself would use a different command than open to open the JPEG, just as a side note. Yes, to open an image on uh, Linux, you would use EOG, I believe, which stands for Eye of Gnu, I suppose. Gnome. Gnome. Eye of Gnome. Gnome. Uh, so instead of the open command. So let's do this again. If, so I often end up saving images with crosshairs and then, and then saying, oh, something. And then I, then I turn the crosshairs off and then save it again. Save Fred, set. And then let's go back to the terminal and open fred.jpg. Fred is now crosshair free. Why did I choose the name Fred? Well, if you, any of you who ever watched the old I Love Lucy show may remember Fred Mertz. He was my hero. Before you close that terminal, it might be worth noting that AFNI uh, comes with a couple programs to help people open images as well across platform if they want. Yes. So you could type AIV in yeah. the name of the yes. file? AIV means AFNI Image Viewer, and I can open fred.jpg, and then this would open this. If there was more than one image on the command line, it would appear like an AFNI Image Viewer, because it is an AFNI Image Viewer, just in a different program, uh, and would have a slider on the bottom to let you scroll between the images. And I think AFNI Open is oh, another yes. program distributed with AFNI, and that will find something on your computer system that's appropriate for opening a file recognized with the extension JPG. 
Yes, AFNI Open is sort of a version of the of the Mac Open program. It says, oh, this is a JPEG file. What programs are available? But AFNI Open, unlike the Mac software open works on Linux as well as on uh, other systems. So here we have AFNI open and then it gives me some sort of uh, error message which uh, I blame Paul for. Wow. Paul is now cackling gleefully in the background. So so for saving the image the crosshairs are often uh, not desired but for uh, interface they're often very desired. So now what if you don't want images in JPEG format? Then you can right click or command click, left click on this, on the save button and you get a list of formats that AFNI will let, will let you export it to. Some of which are things that basically nobody uses anymore such as, uh, does anyone still use the Windows BMP format? I'm not sure. Or encapsulated PostScript, but PNG is a, still a very useful format. And then at the bottom are two formats for saving things in the form of, of video, so animated GIF or uh, MPEG-1 files. I won't do those now, but they exist, and you can play with those as you choose. At the bottom of the image window, which I mentioned a moment ago, there's a, this slider which lets you drag and move between slices, or you can click in the trough, as they call it in the, in the software, before and after the, the slider and just scroll through the images like that. In the images, you can also use the keyboard arrow keys to move between, move the cursor, the crosshairs around left and right, one voxel at a time, which is so, sometimes very handy, of course. There's another button here on the bottom that says DISP. If you click on that, that pops up a big menu of many other uh, I items. But these, uh, most, of, most of these are pretty advanced, and so we won't go into those. And I close that window. One, let's see. Next thing is I want to switch now the underlay. We haven't actually done this yet, but there are many data sets in this directory, and we're going to switch viewing from the anatomical T1 weighted image to uh, an echo planar image. I do that by clicking under on the underlay button there. Here is the name of the data set that was chosen. Why was that first? Because it's alphabetically first. The next image in the alphabetical order is EPIR1, which is echoplanar image, which is functional MRI. And this is, there were three runs for this subject, but in this directory we only have one, R1. And you can see here a little shorthand showing this is echoplanar, 3D plus time, and 152 time points. So I click on set, and we get something that looks, should look different. Why does it not, why does it not look different? Underlay, EPI. There we go. I didn't, I didn't click properly. So there we are. There we have now the sagittal move up in the brain, and we get something that looks typical. This is echoplanar images. If you've never looked at echoplanar images before, they don't look anywhere near as good as the T1-weighted structural images, partly because they're low spatial resolution, partly because they're not designed to have good tissue contrast between different types of tissue. They're designed to produce images that do signal intensity fluctuates with blood oxygen level. They're designed to be good in time, not necessarily look good in space. So that's why, that's, so for two reasons, they, they're not visually appealing perhaps, but scientifically they're very important. So these are still images. You can do all the other things you did. We've done with AFNI controller and more. But one of the things you can do with data that has a time axis is you can open up graphs. I'm going to close the sagittal view of this because it is we're running out of screen space. I'm going to make this axial image a little smaller because I'm going to open up the axial graph window. This is an AFNI graph viewer. And we see what we're looking at are nine graphs, three by three matrix, it's called in the software, that show uh, the graphs of, the th of nine voxels from the data set uh, through time. There's 152 points in time, and so we're seeing 152 time points in each of these subgraph windows. <coughs> and 
So you can see which voxels are, are being highlighted in the graph by if I move this window to be slightly larger, you can see the central cross of the crosshairs is now a little box that's three voxels on a side. If I make the crosshair cursors blue by clicking on the color button in the main FD controller, perhaps they're a little more visible, you can clearly see I have a three voxel by three voxel layout here. So let me shrink this window back down because of screen space. And there we have. So this is an AFNI graph viewer. It's linked to the AFNI image viewer, that is, in, in XY coordinates. That is, if I go click somewhere else in the brain, I get, uh, I, I jump around. So one of the things you can see here as I jump around, you can see that uh, there's various features in the data. One of the features is that the very first time point is bright. It is, has big numbers. The time point that the image we're showing at is, is, is get indicated by this red ball here. Over in the AFNI main controller on the left, it says index equals. This is time index zero. Remember, AFNI counting starts at zero, which is the origin of the Peano arithmetic system, which I'm sure you're all interested in. I can move the time index by clicking index up, arrow up one, two, three, four, five, and if you look back in the graph window, as I do that, the red ball bounces. But in the graph window, I can also use the, if I move the cursor over the graph window, I can also just use the arrow keys on the keyboard to move forward in time. And the index controller mat changes to match. You can also say there's this big, another feature in this is there's this big spike in the image. And that, we can move the time point to that point just by clicking near clicking on or near this spike if I click the left click the mouse cursor in this uh, central subgraph it just moves the time point to the closest point on the graph well there there and so if this is if this was your data you might be interested what's wrong with this thing why is this one so different if I move backward and forward in time uh, by using the the cursor keys on the keyboard. I move left, left cursor moves me backward in time one, then right moves me forward again. If I move back and forth through this time point, we see the image changes shape moderately dramatically compared to sort of the other times nearby. I move, move back and forth one time point just before this change. Nothing, you see some fluctuations, but nothing dramatic in the image. But as I move back to the spike, it's dramatic. But it's still not obvious what happened. It's just big. It's a lot more obvious if we switch to the axial view or sagittal view uh, image and we move back and forth through time. It's uh, a little more obvious. This is motion. Now, in fact, in this real this real data, there wasn't a lot of motion, so this is actually synthetic motion in, put here to illustrate the point of that looking at your data is important to see if it's got corrupted in some way. Yes? I'm sorry, could you remind me how to get to the exact coordinate you're at? Uh, the space coordinate or the time coordinate? The co space coordinate. This, to get to the exact space coordinate, I, 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 here the space coordinate I'm at is 225512. So if you, if you wanted to get there, I'd right click on that uh, and jump and then say jump to XYZ and then I type uh, those numbers which I just read to you, which I don't remember anymore, so it's 22, 56 actually, and 12. Set. And then nothing actually changes because I'm already there. If I wanted to go to the mirror image location in the brain, left, right, well, X is the left, right axis. So I would change the, to the mirror image location, or at least in the coordinate system, would be minus 22. So that should jump me over to the, the right side of the image. And as long as you're going to bring it up, how do we get to the same time index? The same time index, if you want to be exactly the same time index I'm at, you would type it into index in the index here. Thing. If, you want it, if you know what time index you want to be. If you just want to move approximately, you can click somewhere in the image. Uh, so I say, oh, in the graph window rather, you say, oh, it must be around here. And then you say, oh, wait, I'm at 51. And then say, oh, I have to move back seven, which in this case I'm doing with the arrow key. Another question. I noticed before the spikes were in the upward direction, and now here they're on the downward direction. 
Is that a left right thing or what what determines if a spike is up or down or can we know? Most probably the spike in this case which is caused by motion is ca is that if you imagine the voxel grid in space is determined by the magnet gradient imaging system not by the it's not attached to a person's head is attached to the three the several ton scanner and so you if a person moves their head through the scanner a, a bright voxel it, what was a bright tissue in the voxel may the, the person moves their head dark tissue may move into there slight, slightly less bright and that will be a downward deflection and that and uh, or it could be the opposite of voxel which was sort of average brightness uh, some bright tissue in this type of image, CSF, cerebrospinal fluid, is brighter, the brightest tissue, so uh, or so that uh, CSF moves in, uh, you'll see brightness. And the edge of the brain is very dramatic because, of course, outside the brain, the images are very dark, and at the edge, it's bright. So you usually see a lot of stuff at the edge of the brain, a lot of spikes. This place I happen to click on, which is uh, a different coordinates, which you can see over here, not only do we have a spike there, but we also have below it a drift, sort of this long, slow drift, which doesn't have any other real. This is probably caused by smaller subject head movements over a long period of time. And these long, slow drifts, when we get to the analysis part, are something that interferes with the signal changes we actually like. And therefore, we have the pre-processing will have to deal with these long, slow drifts. This, the pre-processing of the data has to deal with the data as it is, not as we wish it was. We wish it was flat, and then bold signal changes would cause things to go up and then go back down, and it'd be easy. And we wish there weren't any spikes in the data. We wish the subjects didn't move, jerk their heads around sometimes. All of these things we may wish for, but that doesn't get us ponies or in this case beautiful clean data we have to massage the data to make it nicer and that's what pre-processing is about but we'll talk about that in the analysis talks so if i jump back to where i was a moment ago over in the left here this is not a bad place to indicate so this is at coordinates about 58 6 and 12. so not a bad place to indicate what's going on here is we see the images, the time series graphs rather, have a distinct different quality than the place we were just at. I can switch back to that with jump back. We see spikes, this drift, but we don't see any other real structure in the data. It's just sort of noisy. But now I jump back again to my fit, my coordinates, 58, 6, 12. We see pot structure in the data, a lot of structure in time. Like it, it, the central voxel, the one below it, the, the one over here in the right upper right corner. This is the task. And this is a data set where the subject was given a task that was on for 20 seconds and off for 10. And they included an auditory component. And I happened to be over in the, in the left auditory cortex. So that's not surprising. The subject listened to things. And there we are. This kind of data is the kind of data that would first people it was so visible in the data you don't need statistics or processing to say that something's going on here what you need is statistics and processing to one uh, deal with the weaker cases where it's not so obvious visually and two to convince a journal to accept your paper the two most important things in the world so now there's uh, one more task in the list of quick tasks and that is so here there's there's a, a, bu there are a bunch of key presses which you can press into the graph window to do things uh, for example capital I and lowercase I so here I'm in the graph window I click in this what does capital I do I want to try it it seems to be eating my time series. That's right. It does eat your time series from the left. It, 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 I means ignore. And so it, 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 it starts ignoring the first time point and the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and sixth. Lowercase i undoes that one at a time. 
this is a way to get rid of this initial spike in the in, in, in the time series graphs, which is more obvious in this one here, the center that I'm at now. I move the center by clicking in a subgraph over here. So if I want to move back, I was in this one, I click in this lower left corner, the subgraph moves. The time coordinate doesn't move, just the subgraph. If I want to move time coordinate, uh, then I have to click in the central subgraph, the one that's outlined in this little gold box. So if I move here, we see quite a big spike. If I click I, then suddenly that spike is removed. That's useful for various graphing purposes. Question. So, so just to be sure, these these voxels that we're seeing, these time series correspond to the blue box in your X and your image. That is correct. These 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 time series. There's in every in this data set, there are 152 numbers stored in every voxel. The image is showing me one of those no sets of numbers in one 3D volume converted into something image-like, the grayscale. But those 150, we're only looking at, at one of those time, time points, in this case, the zeroth one. And then I change, if I click forward, I move the image, and you can see if I move quickly, you can see it fluctuate a little bit, but it doesn't change dramatically. But the, 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 but the numbers are changing, and that's what the graph is showing. It's 152 time points. The I button just igno will ignore the first time point. The capital I button will ignore the first time point, and then the second time point, and so on. That's an example, though, of, of keyboard shortcuts that are in the graph window. And the way to find out what all of them are is takes if you click on the button help button from a very long time ago, and we click that over the graph window, it pops up a list of a, a, a list of keyboard shortcuts. Keyboard shortcuts seem mysterious when you're first using a program, but as soon as you learn how to use them, they become your friend because you can do things very quickly. So, if, if, if for exa example, uh, suppose you want to take a screen snapshot of this. I'm just let, move, let my eyes drift over this. I see the capital L key, but it has this stupid AFNI logo here. If I type the capital L, it will turn the ca into this graph window. It will turn the AFNI logo off. So now I can take a screenshot without having advertising for AFNI. Of course, that may, may or not be a beautiful screenshot. The V button, this is another fun thing. V is for video. That I can make a sort of a, a movie of this image by holding the cursor, the, the sorry, not the, uh, by clicking in the graph window and pressing the, uh, and then pressing the left arrow key or right arrow key on the, on, and I make a movie, but that means I have to hold this key down. If I press the V key, V, it's over the graph window, then it starts a video through time. Nope, my hands are off the keyboard, which you can't see, but I'm waving my hands in the air. And it will do this, well, basically forever until I do something to stop it, which is the simplest way to stop it is to press the space bar. So that can be useful to see if the image does something weird, jerky, for example which occasionally happens, not due to subject motion, but because the scanner problems. You, yes? What if I really like that time series and I want to do something quantitatively with it? Is there a way I can save out the numbers of it? Wow, that's a great question. Yes, there's, uh, there's at least two different ways to save it. In the lower right corner of this menu of this window, graph window, you see there's a, a menu that's labeled opt, which is cleverly short for options. I click on that, it pops up a menu, and we he see here something that says write center. That will write the center numbers, all in this case 152 of them, out to a file. And like that. And it just writes it. It doesn't, it, it doesn't ask you for a name because it, uh, if you do this a lot, it becomes very tedious to type the names in. So the name is simply, we go out to the terminal window, no, it doesn't print the name out anymore in the terminal window. Why does it not do that? Who wrote this program? Oh, that was me. Never mind. We can see it here, though. It saved it. The last file created in time is, is called 0610460101D. And if we look at this, we see that it's just a bunch of numbers. Just then be imported into any spreadsheet, for example. 
almost anything can read that format. So the, the numbers in the file name refer to the voxel 3D indexes in the 3D grid. So you can see those, you can see those if in, in the coordinate window here, we click on the right, right click on the coordinate window and it says, instead of, instead of XYZ coordinates, we switch to voxel indexes. Now it's showing me the, the 3D grid. Just in three in three dimensions, uh, a voxel is stored as uh, indexed into a three dimensional array. Uh, Sixty one slices in in one direction, forty six slices in in the other direction, and ten slices in in the third direction. Inside the program, it has to keep track of this, of course. Outside the program, you often don't need to know that. But if you that's that's the file name that gets saved there. I also noticed those numbers in the lower left of the graph window. Hopefully. That that is correct. How about you? I noticed the file extension of this uh, time series file ended with dot one d. Yes, the one d file format is just the AFNI suffix for files that are stored as columns or uh, columns and rows of numbers. This was a thing with one number, one column that uh, one number per row, and in this case, 152 uh, numbers down the column. But you could have other, you could have ten num uh, a grid of ten numbers and so on like that, which is a useful way of exchanging relatively small amounts of numbers. In principle, it's possible to convert a data set, not in, interactively, but with a command line, into an entire grid of numbers. But the vastness of those numbers would be so big that it would be difficult for most text-based programs to deal with it. Someone once asked me, can I just load an entire data set into an Excel spreadsheet? And I said, I can create such a file for you, but I don't think Excel is going to like loading uh, 152 time points times 50,000 voxels but you can try it if you want. I have never tried it myself, and I find it difficult to believe it would be a useful exercise. Even if you could manage to get it loaded, it would be so much data that the program might not like it very much. But who am I to judge? Okay, I am somebody to judge. But there are a whole bunch of keyboard uh, shortcuts li list listed here. Um, and there are also other keyboard shortcuts on the opt menu. If you click up, you see there are many submenus. For example, there's a submenu matrix. Matrix is the is the word in the program for the the three by three grid gridness. As we have three, what this three by three is not built into the program as the only thing you can show. You can show there's a click on the matrix button. We get this submenu, and we can change it to one by one. For example, like that. This is useful if you're really concerned about one location and you want to drill into drill into the data. Often this is something that uh, scanner physicists will use when they're trying to figure out what's going on, but uh, it's up to you. Now, you see the shortcuts here. There's also down or up. I can't go have fewer than one, but I can have more than one. I can have two. If I click on up, I get... I got, I got two. If I click on up again, I get three, and so on. But you saw that there was a lowercase m and an uppercase m next to matrix in the down and up. Lowercase m reduces the number of the matrix size by one. The capital M re increases it by one. So I can, by pressing capital M into this window, I can continue up. And once you know this, you almost never use the matrix menu because even if I wanted to go up to 10 by 10, I could just press M, m a lot. Now, is this is having so many subgraphs useful? Not often, because now they become very tiny. But nevertheless, it is, for some purposes, it's use, useful. So the program allow, allows, I can't remember what the upper limit is, but it's in the 20s or 30s, uh, which is generally more than makes any sense. And would there be any corresponding change in the image window if we could see it? Yes, because I was hiding the image window from you because I'm a cruel monster of a human being. But if you, uh, if, I'll make the image window a little bigger to make this perhaps more obvious. So watch the crosshairs in the image window as I cr increase the matrix size with the M key over here. You see it's getting bigger. And this is actually one use for uh, having a very big uh, array. If there's something funny going on in the image, you can 
you can't see any details in the subgraphs, but you can sort of see pa patterns. Like here, we can see a pattern that they're all very small, and then over here, they're bigger. And that's, of course, because this is the left side is off the edge of the brain. But if there was some peculiar artifact in the image, perhaps you might be able to see it if you did this. This is mo uh, mostly, again, has been used by MR f systems physicists or engineers. So I just press the M button and, it, and, and, and the little square that indicates. 3 by 3 is chosen because it's sort of a nice place to start. It's easy to go down to 1 if you want, but it does give you a little bit of synoptic picture of what's going on. And you can see, even in this, as we click around, you can see this is unsmoothed data that voxel, neighboring voxels, some of which are very similar. This left middle and middle middle are quite similar, and then the one above that is quite different. So this shows you that fMRI does, in fact, have spatial resolution. There's a lot of apparent brain activity in this middle voxel, and the one in the top middle is basically nothing. So the, the opt menu has many other things. If you have, uh, if you notice the vertical grids here, the program just chooses some vertical grids, but you can ch you can get rid of them entirely, or you can change the grid spacing. You can change it up and down automatically with the G keys. You you can, or you can choose the the, the, the spacing. If you say you had a, a regular spacing that was regular every 30, 30 TRs, uh, then you could choose 30 and click that, for example. Or you could just make it some really, if you don't like the grid at all, just make it some really big number like 10,000, and then the grid is gone. You can also change the colors. The colors that are used are the defaults here, white background, black graph, and so on. But you can change, you can change these uh, if you want uh, for some purpose. That is, you can... Uh, for example, change data is being using thick lines at the bottom of this of this of this menu. The bottom of this menu, colors, etc. menu, we see that here thick is defined as two pixels wide on the screen. I can make thick four pixels wide and get a fatter graph. This looks a little cartoonish, but sometimes as if you want to save this or something, it will look better if it's thicker graphs. And it's up to you. All of these things can also be set by external configuration file in AFNI, which will hopefully be the subject of a later presentation to go through the uh, configuration file, which has, over the years, accumulated a lot of configuration settings. So this is it for the graph, AFNI graph viewer at this time. But as you can see, there's a lot of other options on, on, the, on this menu, and hopefully we'll get to them at some later time. Thank you, and that's all I have for now.